Hello, and welcome to Deloitte's Debrief's webcast series in Asia Pacific. Um, our webcast today is titled Customs Interactions with Transfer Pricing. My name is Hamish Clark, and I'm a director in the transfer pricing team in Deloitte, Singapore. Um, I have the pleasure of hosting today's webcast alongside Tony Kerr, who's a tax director in the customs team in Deloitte, Singapore. Um, you can access our bios on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and before I introduce today's agenda, um, I'll highlight a couple of features that you can use uh, as part of the webcast console. Um, so first of all, users are in listen-only mode. Um, we certainly welcome your questions, um, and you can submit questions at any time in the box on the bottom right of your screen. Um, We'll do our best to respond to your questions during the presentation. Otherwise, we'll get back to you later on. Um, secondly, um, if you want to download the slides for today's session, then please click on the download box on your screen. And then thirdly, if you require um, an attendance record for the event, please download your CPE certificate by clicking on the icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, now, we'll go on to uh, give an overview of the agenda for today's session. Um, we'll start with a quick reminder of the basic concepts of customs and transfer pricing. And um, we'll then talk about um, how and when customs and transfer pricing can interact. We'll talk about the similarities and differences between the two sets of rules uh, and going through each of the valuation methods used in the, in the different rules. And we'll give some examples of the difficulties um, which can be encountered uh, where the two rules, uh, two sets of rules can differ. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll up bring you up to date on some efforts which have been made at a global uh, level to, to converge the two sets of rules. And then finally, at the end, we'll leave a bit of time for a Q&A. Uh, so please, uh, please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A box. Uh, and now I'll pass over to Tony who will give us an intro to the customs rules. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you for being here. Um, I, I guess one of the um, reasons from my perspective, too, of um, the bringing this um, um, session to you is the fact that, you know, business has been uh, through quite a lot of turmoil in, in recent times from the trade disputes uh, to what we're going through now with the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and that's really brought a lot of stress and, and a lot of uh, extra planning on businesses. Um, so through all of this, a, a lot of uh, businesses have had to adapt their supply and value chains um, to meet the, the uh, stresses and strains of, of the supply chain at this time. Um, and so, you know, if, if you look around uh, the Asia region now, there are a number of disparities in, in customs treatment and processes for handling uh, adjustments. Uh, and, and the process is often quite complex in some countries and could take some considerable time. So, you know, the session today is really to uh, make you aware of, of the fact that you need to give this sort of consideration to um, the adjustments in transfer pricing and even setting of transfer pricing. Now, going into the basics uh, of, of customs valuation, um, the key thing here is that for all signatories to the WTO ag um, agreement, they must adopt the customs valuation rules, which fall under Article 7 of, of the Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Um, and they, it's really like doing a cut and paste because you have to take the rules, principles, um, uh, and methodologies that are in that Article 7 and transpose them directly into your law. You don't, from a customs perspective, from a country perspective, they don't have a lot of room to play around with those uh, and pick and choose. The primary method of, of value is transaction value, uh, and transaction value is the total price paid or payable 
um, and that means whether it's a direct or indirect uh, and, and exclusive of any, any other charges like um, in some countries they exclude transportation and, and insurance, um, but a country has the right to choose whether they exclude it or include it. Um, but it is the, the total payment uh, to be made to or for the benefit of the seller. So that's the total payment. Um, <clears throat> so if you cannot use transaction value, then, then one must move through uh, the other methodologies of, of um, arriving at a value, but, and they must move through those sequentially. So you cannot just jump to a method that you think you want to use. Uh, and you have to be able to justify that move. <clears throat> um, but having said that transaction value is, a, is the primary method, transaction value um, must have some adjustments to that price paid or payable as well. If, if the elements uh, that I'll read out in a second uh, are not already included. So if you're looking at, at what Customs will generally um, term assist. These are materials, components, parts, and similar items which are actually incorporated into the imported goods. Um, then you have the tools, dies, molds, and, and those sort of things which are used in the production of the imported goods. Uh, and then you go into your engineering development uh, and, and um, R&D areas. Uh, and then the one that often crops up in, in, in the TP side too is royalties and license fees related to the goods being valued that the buyer must pay either directly or indirectly as a condition of sale of the goods being valued. And then finally, the value of any part of any, any uh, subsequent resale. So that's... Uh, if you on sell the goods that you've imported in the country of import uh, and you have a profit sharing agreement, then whatever you send back to the seller of those goods has to be get uh, declared to customs as well, forms the value of the, of the uh, original import. <clears throat> um, and then when you, when you go on to um, looking at the what I think is, is often termed um, or often seen uh, in terms of transfer pricing from a corporate perspective versus customs valuation, um, you often see that, that um, people say, oh, well, customs always wants the higher value uh, and the income uh, corporate transfer price has always got to be low because of the taxes. Um, and, that, and, and yes, that is right. There's always that competing tension uh, concerning imported goods. So, you know, if you look at the Customs Authority objective, it's to ensure that all appropriate elements are included in customs value and is, and is um, not understated. Uh, and I guess from the direct tax authority objective, they're looking at ensuring the transfer price does not um, include uh, inappropriate uh, elements um, and that, <clears throat> so, so the trade objective generally is for, from a customs perspective, lower customs value, uh, equaling a, a desirable or reduced duty liability, and and that. Um, so, yes, quite often the, the value does does end up to be a little bit higher from a customs perspective, but that's that's generally. Uh, it can, it can work out the other way as well. Um, in back. English. Yeah, thank you, Tony. So we can, uh, thank you for introducing the customs rules. So we can move on to the first polling question now um, to get a feel. Um, I'm going to go through to the polling slide, yeah. Um, so yeah, it'd be useful for us to hear from the audience um, to feel uh, as to how often you've come across an um, interaction between transfer pricing and customs. Um, so it'd be great if you could look at this first polling question and choose the uh, answer which best fits your circumstances. I'll read through the question and the answers. 
Um, so have you ever had difficulties making a transfer pricing adjustments due to customs risks or limitations? And if so, what was your greatest challenge? Um, so is your greatest challenge of making the TP adjustment, has it been dealing with the customs authorities, providing the correct supporting evidence, understanding the customs valuations, laws and principles, uh, or, or um, all of the above challenges cause difficulties? Or finally, um, if you've not, the bottom answer, I've not encountered such an issue, if you've not had any difficulties uh, amending your transfer pricing with customs issues. So great if you can uh, take a second to choose the most appropriate answer there. Um, and it takes a few seconds for the answers to come through on the system. Um, so while we're waiting, I can just ask Tony for some of his experience. And Tony, what recent trends have you seen in this area? Okay. Uh, well, in terms of um, recent trends, there are there are customs authorities which are trying to understand uh, transfer pricing. Um, you know, an example of that will be um, Malaysian Customs, which is is um, looking to get training and stuff on that on that and understand um, customs customs valuation and transfer pricing and what to look at. There are other customs authorities now in the region who are also looking um, at doing similar things as well. So there is an awareness that that they need to look at it, um, and I think that's that's good because um, if if these um, authorities can get some sort of training or some sort of advice, uh, that'll be good for business. That's interesting. Thanks for sharing that experience. And I think we've got the poll results ready. Um, okay, so what have we got here? So the uh, the highest percentage is finding all of the above issues a challenge. So uh, and then a fairly even spread between the individual issues. So we're seeing people trying to make transfer pricing adjustments with with challenges arising in, in various spaces, uh, uh, dealing with the customs authorities providing the evidence, understanding the valuation rules. Um, but it looks like most often all of those challenges challenges are presenting difficulties, um, which I guess shows the importance of the of the topic. So uh, good that we're, we're sharing some insights today. Um, and then about a quarter haven't actually encountered such an issue, but uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting comparison. Thank you. Um, and we'll move on to the next slide. And um, this is a um, chance for me to just cover the basics of transfer pricing. Um, so Tony's introduced customs, um, given us, given us the uh, outline of the, the basic rules. Um, I'll cover off the basics of transfer pricing fairly quickly, because I'm aware that a lot of people on this call will have worked in this area for many years. Um, the transfer pricing rules um, are cover, cover the pricing of intergroup transactions. So when you've got a company in one jurisdiction selling a good or a service or a royal intellectual property or a financial instrument uh, to a buyer, an intergroup buyer in the same group in another jurisdiction, uh, normally with different tax rates, then transfer pricing rules are likely to be relevant. Um, arm's length pricing is the key principle. That's the fundamental principle that I'm sure we've all heard of. Uh, and that just means that the transaction should, between related parties should be priced in the same way that is if, as if it was between unrelated parties, between third parties. Uh, and that's uh, it's priced uh, between uh, in the same way that third parties uh, undertaking a similar transaction with similar conditions, uh, how they would price their mm -hmm. transaction. And most countries follow the OECD transfer pricing guidelines and that outlines the five main pricing methods. Um, and today we're going to give, try and give you a good understanding of when these methods are aligned with the customs rules and also when they can come into conflict with the customs rules. Um, so we go on to the next, that's the basics of transfer pricing. We'll go on to the next slide. Um, and this is where we're going to try and uh, cover off the sorts of scenarios where transfer pricing rules and customs rules can cross paths. 
Um, so we often see companies follow a transfer pricing policy um, that, for example, requires a certain set of group entities to earn a margin within a benchmarked range. So let's say um, we decided that the tested entity, the TB policy requires a tested entity to, to earn a benchmarked margin between 3 and 5%. So in that case, the transfer prices would be set over the course of a year, such that the tested entity earns the appropriate margin within the benchmarked range. Um, and, and that benchmark range is defined by the policy, which is established you know, at the beginning of the year and will often be in place for many years. Um, now, in this small example, um, which aligns with the OECD guidelines, um, the TP policy actually provides a reasonable amount of flexibility um, as long as the taxpayer uh, maintains good TP documentation, um, it has got an accurate functional analysis, the benchmarking is up to date, um, and importantly, if they can provide a P&L which demonstrates that the margin is within the benchmarked range, if you fulfil those criteria, um, then the TP risk should be pretty well managed. Um, so, you know, that it, we're looking at it over the course of the year, as long as we hit that margin, then we can normally be comfortable with the transfer pricing. Um, Tony, um, it'd be great if you could ex uh, compare that scenario to uh, how that fits with the customs landscape. Yeah. Um, okay. From so from a customs perspective, going back to what I said earlier, that you, you're looking predominantly, and, and from a customs perspective, is is that they try to have 99% of, of, of imports come across the border using transaction value, so total price paid or payable for the goods. Um, and, and when you look at what that total price paid or payable for goods and you're talking about profit, remember that customs looks at the good, at the actual product that comes across the border um, <clears throat> so it, it's it's quite specific in, in that sense so in a in a transfer pricing study for instance you might you might set a profit margin based on uh, either a range of goods or profitability as a, and, and that um, customs comes back to if you presented a study like that Come, customs will come back and look at that study and say, okay, does how does that compare to if you looked exactly at that good that we have in front of us? How does that profit margin stack up? How does it stack up if you sold that good to a unrelated third party? Uh, right. So, you, so you're looking at it from that perspective. <clears throat> so, when you move through the this here on on the customs and uh, valuation and, and TP, you move around to to looking at some of the adjustments that are, are made purely from a customs perspective, uh, like when you look at IP and I touched on royalties before, and royalties is always a key one key addition uh, to the the value uh, of goods um, because customs looks at it and, and and in terms of royalties for instance the adjustment is is made on the basis of of the royalty being paid directly or indirectly as a condition of that sale so as opposed to other payments where they are directly or indirectly paid to the seller um the, the designers of the customs valuation recognise that royalties don't get paid to, always get paid to the seller of the goods, and so the payment may go to someone else, but it, it, if it is a condition of the sale of those goods that you pay that royalty, then those royalties get added in. So there are a number of adjustments and, and uh uh, things that intangibles that need to get added into those the the value, and I think that's where that's where a major difference comes in when you're looking at a, a transaction value from a customs uh, perspective, um, <clears throat> and especially when you're looking at at 
retroactive transfer pricing adjustments um, and, and whether, in fact, they can imp Im, uh, impact the past customs values and, and duty. And the answer is yes. Um, and the problem for business is that quite often uh, the process of doing that, of, of declaring that, is very complex. Uh, there are a, a number of customs authorities now around the globe that actually are putting in place um, processes to handle that, but there are still a lot in Asia who don't have that process, but you are still compelled to make that adjustment. Okay. <clears throat> uh, next, Hamish. Yeah, I think we're ready to go to the next slide and look at the um, slide, uh, recent uh, recent trends. Um, okay. Tony, do you want um, to in 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 back in two thousand and six, two thousand and seven, there were two joint conferences held between the WCO and the OECD. Um, these were held in Brussels. Um, I was a speaker at both conferences. And the purpose of, the, of these um, conferences was because of the, the um, issues that business was having in, in, with transfer pricing and customs valuation. So they were looking at some way of, of a, a merger or formal alignment of the two systems but the suggestion of that really met with a lot of pushback uh, from customs authorities around the, around the, uh, the globe. Um, <clears throat> so while that was the negative side, there was a positive, and the positive of, of that was that um, a focus group was established in, in 2007 to identify problems and suggest possible solutions. Um, and at its 31st session in October 2010, uh, the um, uh, Technical Committee on Customs Valuation within the WCO approved Commentary 23.1, which, which is a, a commentary which recognises that a TP study may be used as a basis for examining circumstances of sale, right? So... In 2015, the WCO also issued um, its guide to customs valuation and transfer pricing. Uh, and then further from that, we've seen um, countries such as Australia, Canada, Korea, UK and US um, start to change some of their um, ways in which their procedures and that in, in respect to um, TP studies and the acceptance of TP documentation. Um, mm. Korea in particular is one that's quite to the forefront in, in uh, doing, taking a lot of action in this area. So it's, it's um, really a benchmark, I guess, um, in, in the customs arena. Next slide, please. Yeah, and then I can, um, so what we've seen uh, so far describe some similarities and some differences uh, that we've mentioned over the past few slides between the transfer pricing rules and the customs rules. So this uh, table just gives a summary of, uh, of, of what we've seen so far. Um, so the basic principle of the two sets of rules is essentially the same. Uh, arm's length is the principle that's used under transfer pricing and fair value under customs, um, but the objectives are different in quite an important way. Um, and like we've said already, with customs, it's the import value of each transaction. So when there's a good physically imported into a country, it's that individual transaction. Um, whereas with transfer pricing, it's typically allocating income or allocating profits uh, over the course of a year between a buyer and a seller. Um, obviously, there's different TP methods, but, but that, that is a broad uh, difference between the two sets of rules. The rules are sourced uh, from, from different 
uh, bodies, which is uh, still very important. Um, we're going to come to the methods in a moment, uh, but some of the some of the methods are not fully aligned between customs and transfer pricing. Um, you know, in, in terms of the transaction view, transfer pricing is typically viewed in the aggregate so over the course of a year. Is the tested party earning the correct margin? Uh, you know, the, the cut method is more is more transaction by transaction, but but the most more often than not is viewed in an aggregate way. Whereas, like we've said, customs is transaction by transaction. Uh, there's a couple of other important differences. Um, the definition of related parties, uh, transfer pricing it varies from country to country. Uh, so Fifty percent is quite uh, a control definition is quite common. Uh, with customs, it's a it's a light a lower uh, definition, a lower criteria for when it, when you become a related party. Um, and then at the bottom of the slide, there an important difference, and you'll have picked up in this already, is that transfer pricing applies to all intragroup transactions, be it goods, services, royalties from intellectual property, financial instruments. Uh, customs is really just focused on the um, on the tangible goods. Um, so that's a quick summary of, of of the different features of the two sets of rules, and we'll go on to the next slide and actually uh, look at some of the specific valuation methods, uh, comparing the TP methods that we're probably familiar with, and trying to align that with an equivalence customs method. Um, so what what we'll do is we'll we'll go around the clock clockwise, starting from one o'clock. And if I look down the right hand side, there's um, there's the, the right hand side is from a transfer pricing perspective, is all focused on the cup method. So the comparable uncontrolled price. I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. It's essentially using a market price or evidence from third party transactions to come up with a price for the transaction. And it's still the preferred method per the OECD transfer pricing guidelines. And we split it into three elements here, the internal cup and the external cup, internal just being when the taxpayer is selling the same goods to a, uh, to a third party, external when there's a transaction between two third parties. Um, and, then we're, um, uh, and, then, and then we put another one there of saying a lenient external cup. And, this is probably familiar to anyone who's looked in detail at the comparable uncontrolled price method. So you, you, in the perfect world, you'd have a, an exact comparable, an exact cup where you say, yeah, it's exactly the same product, exactly the same terms and conditions, getting sold intragroup and uh, third party, in which case you've got a very strong uh, transfer pricing evidence. Um, in reality, you tend to have a a slightly gray area where there's certain terms or certain differences between the comparable and the tested transaction. Um, so, so yeah, with the cut method still a very important, very widely used transfer price method. Um, and Tony, if I can ask you to comment on the equivalent uh, method in the customs landscape. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the things we've, we've spoken about before, I mentioned before, is that we're always, customs is always focused on transaction value. Um, but, you know, uh, in terms of transaction value and, and, and the TP and the TP study is, is also how do, you, how do you arrive at that profit? Is, 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 the, is the profit element um, profit as applied to that good, or is it applied, uh, arrived at through another method of calculation? Um, <clears throat> and does that does that method of calculation correctly reflect on on the actual um, profit of the of that profitability of that good? If you sold that good, as I said previously, to an unrelated party, um, one one of the other things I'd say too is that. Um, when you're looking at, at these like uh, identical um, or similar goods, if, if you moved out of 
transaction value and you had to move into these, let's say, uh, as a test. In other words, to prove that perhaps that the um, TP is in fact a ideal value or the correct value, I should say, for uh, to use for the import of the goods. So there's, there's always that belief that um, the, the transaction value is, is uh, acceptable because it, it's, um, it can be proven under deductive value. But whether, if, if, in fact, there are no previous importations of identical or similar goods um, into, the, into the country of import, then your computed value, uh, your deductible computed value methods uh, can't be used because effectively there are no test values. Um, and so, you know, the, it, it's, it's very important to, to look at how you are actually valuing your goods. Uh, and I would say that you need to document how you're valuing your goods in terms of the transaction value. Um, but it, again, as I said earlier as well, is that if you move, if you cannot value your goods according to transaction value um, being the main method, and then you need to move into one of the other methods, you have to move through it sequentially. Um, and then you have to provide reason if you cannot uh, value your goods under those various methods. Uh, and so when we move across, you know, if we can cancel out as identical goods, similar goods, we move into deducted or computed values, uh, then again, it's, it's looking again at where do you start and which profit element do you use? Um, because that's important. And then in the, in the cost plus buildup, what are, the, what are the actual costs that are included under a TP? Uh, are there costs that, are, that should be included from a customs perspective that are not already uh, there or have been taken out? Uh, and, those, and so your documentation has to show your total costs uh, of the seller um, in order to be able to verify whether your values are, in fact, Correct. Yeah. Next, next yeah. slide. So we're on the tra transfer oh, oh. pricing. Sorry, pricing equivalent there, where um, you know, we're on the right hand side, where there's a uh, cut method used for TP, uh, the transaction value is likely to be reasonably aligned for customs. But as we go around the clock on the slide. Uh, when we go to in transfer price, if you're using the resale price method, you know, so for example, if you've got a distributor and the distributor is selling to the third party customer for 100, you may choose to set the transfer price at 98 because you're giving the distributor a $2 margin, a 2% margin that's been benchmarked. Uh, and then similarly for cost plus, you may have a service company that's uh, got costs of 100 and you benchmark of 5% markup has been appropriate. So you set the transfer price at 105. Those method, those transfer pricing methods are very well established. They're, they're in place for a lot of intergroup transactions. Uh, the customs equivalents are there, as Tony said, but they're not necessarily uh, as, as well accepted by the authorities. And, you, and, and there's a number of difficulties that can be raised when you're trying to explain that method to the customs authority. Um, and I think there's a similar approach when uh, at 11 o'clock on the on, on the slide, uh, the profit-based methods used in transfer pricing, so the profit splits becoming much more widely applied. We've seen that used very regular, very regularly really since BEPS. Uh, and then the transactional net margin method, where you're benchmarking a net margin, uh, they're they're very widely used methods, uh, but. Tony, maybe maybe you can explain from the customs perspective uh, the fallback method and, and and how often that's accepted. Yeah, you know, you well, yeah, thanks, Hamish. Um, the the 
the fallback method is, is, is basically your, your final method. Uh, in other words, the customs looks to say, okay, every good that comes across the border has a must have a value. So there, there must be a value. You should be able to arrive at a value. So <clears throat> what what the fallback method does is it allows you to be able to provide a degree of flexibility to the interpretation of some of the other methods. So deductive method uh, is you know is there's a, a a timeline if you if you're um, looking at at when your products were imported, or uh, there's a, there's a, or maybe where they were imported from, or who they were manufactured from. Um, so there, there are certain criteria that you can provide a flexible interpretation to, or, or flexibility to. Uh, if you're looking at um, identical, similar goods, where you know, can you say, okay? These were imported, but they weren't imported within a certain time frame. We can extend that time frame out a bit. Uh, so that gives that flexibility. In terms of the other elements, the profit elements and everything else, those um, really remain the same from a customs perspective. It's all about the good that is actually presented for valuation. Nick. Next slide. Okay. Um, so when is when is a, um, a related uh, party price acceptable for customs purposes? Um, again, this is this one here is all around the circumstances of sale. So, well. For the circumstances of sale, you, you need to really provide good documentary evidence of, of an arm's length negotiations. So when you're negotiating your price between your related parties, are, are you doing that in an arm's length way? Um, <clears throat> in other words, you're not being, as the importer, you're not being dictated to that this is the price you will take. Um, you know, and and that and, the, and so the negotiation is as if you are an independent third party, um, and then you you need to also present to customs evidence of of the market value of those goods, um, the selling price, uh, making sure that the selling price equals all costs plus profit and general expenses of the seller, right? So. What I was saying before is that when you're looking at, at constructing the price from a customs perspective, you're looking at, at that price recovering all costs plus the profit and plus the general expenses of that seller. <clears throat> now, in, in I referred to earlier the uh, technical committee our customs value of customs valuation, their commentary 23.1 on the examination of the expression of um, of the circumstances of surrounding the sale, and it states that the question then arises whether a TP study prepared for tax purposes and provided by the importer can be used by customs as a basis for examining the circumstances surrounding the sale, and says, on the one hand, a TP study may be a good source of information if it contains relevant information about the circumstances surrounding the sale. On the other hand, a TP study might not be relevant or adequate in examining the circumstances surrounding the sale because of the substantial and significant differences which exist between the methods in the agreement to determine the value of imported goods and those of the OECD TP guidelines. So basically, and, and this is where a lot of um, countries now who are, who are moving to accept some of the TP studies, they're, they're using 23.1. 
uh, and they're saying, OK, the, the TP study is the base document. But then what, what else have you got to support the way in which you arrived at that, that value, OK? So it's, it's very, very important to make sure that you always um, document what you're doing and when, you're, when you do it and why. Next slide, please. So I can uh, give a few examples here and cover what, what I think is a really topical issue of making a transfer pricing adjustment at the year end in order to bring a tested party back within its benchmarked range. Um, so we were talking earlier about the fact that from a transfer pricing perspective, we'll often say that a particular entity which only deals in intergroup should earn an operating margin of let's say 4%. Um, for various reasons during the year, it's often the case that you get to say December uh, with the calendar year end and the segmented P&L that you should be testing is showing an operating margin of either too high or too low. Uh, in, in, and when I say too high or too low, that's meaning that it's above or below the benchmarked range. Now, purely from a transfer pricing perspective, it might be an idea to go back and retrospectively change some of the transfer prices, maybe introduce a credit note. Uh, but there's, there's mechanisms that can be used to bring the party back within the benchmarked range. Um, now, from a transfer pricing perspective, that's good and well, but this is a classic example where it throws up, or potentially throws up customs issues. Um, so what we're trying to cover here is to let you know uh, in what circumstances a customs authority uh, will allow such a transfer pricing adjustment or where it's maybe not a good idea. Um, we've split, we're splitting this into uh, prospective adjustments and retrospective adjustments. So thinking first of all about forward looking adjustments, if you're planning to change the transfer pricing method but implementing that change from the next calendar year, uh, then the main issue is around price consistency. You know, are, are we giving the customs authority an opportunity to say, well, since you changed the transfer prices, is the is the new price correct or is the old price correct? On what on what um, price should the customs levy be charged? Um, so a bit backwards adjustment. We've seen this quite a number of times with clients where uh, at the year end or, or after the year has been closed. They want to use credit notes or some sort of adjustment to bring the tested party back within its benchmarked range. So, you know, if, if you've got a routine entity which is earning a loss or uh, an entity which has earned more profit than it should have done because the, uh, the transfer price was not set correctly during the year, then can we make a retrospective adjustment? Um, so basically, customs authorities have got a varying position on retrospective adjustments. Um, and, and so, so it ranges from no formal process for declaring a change in the transfer pricing through to formal processes, but individual declaration adjustments. Um, we've, there's examples where there's customs authorities that have got uh, voluntary declarations, voluntary declaration programs, um, permitting certain simple adjustments. Um, at the extreme end, there's potential uh, interests and penalties, even if a voluntary disclosure is made that the price of an import has, um, uh, has been changed. Um, so, you know, some countries yep. will provide refunds and downwards adjustments. Um, but the, the, the other risk here is that, you know, when we're making retrospective adjustments, uh, we're also creating the risk that a tax a customs authority will uh, not allow us to use the, the transaction value, the main method in the future, you know, is it, is it, or they, they may adjust or reject the transaction value in the future uh, once a, an adjustment is made in an earlier year. And Tony, I think you've got examples of, of where this is at. Yeah, I can, I can jump in there. Um, you're, you're exactly right. I, I think, you know, when you look at, at um, Considering um, TP adjustments, 
you really need to to be aware of the fact. I mean, if you're working in the TP environment in a, in a company, um, <clears throat> you need to be communicating with the people on the ground or the people in your customs and, and logistics teams um, as you as you're working through uh, any TP adjustments, because the impact. Um, for the person on the ground um, can be quite huge. Um, you know, if, if you think about it, uh, let's say you have a downward, um, you're, you're adjusting your whole transfer price. Uh, you're setting a new transfer price and, um, and that transfer price is going to drop from what it was for the last 12 months or six months or whatever, the, the minute that that drops, it, it raises a red flag in, in, in the um, analysis centres of, of customs. And so they may ask questions immediately. They may stop your shipment immediately, or they may simply sit and watch. Um, but what, whatever you do, when you when you make these adjustments, if you're not communicating with your with your people, your customs team, then they're the ones who are going to get hit with the surprise. Um, they they the the importer can be hit with penalties. They can be hit, as I said before, with stopped shipments. Um, there is a lot that customs can actually do. Now, quite often, customs will immediately react and they will come and ask the questions and then you, uh, the person on the ground is going to have to prove that that, um, that new value is correct. Now, if they prove that that value is correct, then customs' next uh, question is going to be, therefore, all, the, all these shipments for the last five years, three years, or whatever, should have been at this at this price or, or whatever. And so, if you've got a low value, I don't think customs are going to ask for the back to to refund everything back. But if you've got a higher value coming in, then customs are going to uh, certainly want to penalise you. So you, you've got to be you've got to be well aware of that and the fact that they can hold your shipments until they get satisfied satisfactory answers um, so there are a lot of implications for it and when you're doing individual adjustments like year-end adjustments uh, quarterly adjustments whatever those may be you need to document those very clearly and again keep communicating internally that these are going to happen and and when I say document them, you need to be able to provide evidence so that the people doing the import can have that evidence to present to customs to justify one that the that the adjustment either needs to be included in total or only a portion needs to be included. All right? But you need to be able to provide that that information. Uh, to to your um, importers and their customs people. Next slide, please. Okay. <clears throat> Again, and, and I think I, uh, I've covered that to a, a this, to a certain extent. You know, your, wherever your transactions, uh, your adjustments are, are they year end? They're closing your books. Are they? Whenever that happens. The whole point here is, is being able to document things, document what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you're doing it. Um, and what are, another key thing is what are the elements? Now, I, I'll go back uh, as an example. I did a TP adjustment for a client a few years back in before Taiwan changed its its uh, adjustments, transfer pricing adjustment rules. Uh, and prior to that, the 
the customs and the tax department there required substantive documentation on how the uh, adjustment was arrived at, what were what made up the elements of that those adjustments, and why those adjustments were necessary. Um, so that had to be quite detailed, and I think it took us probably nearly two or three months of of just going through company data to be able to work out why those adjustments were made and what part of those adjustments should actually be declared to customs and what should not. Uh, and then those had to be each individually supported. So if you want to save your, yourselves a lot of times and a lot of headache, it's better to, at the time of doing these adjustments, to actually start um, planning them and documenting what you're doing. Okay? Next slide, please. So we're on to the recap, uh, getting towards the end of the presentation. Um, but before we go to the Q&As, uh, let's recap the key points. Um, first thing to say is that the reason we decided to run this webinar is because we've seen clients making TP adjustments or wanting to make adjustments or introduce new TP policies without really any consideration for the customs implications. And as we've just heard, this is potentially a really risky approach. Um, you really want to consider the two issues hand in hand. So I think the main takeaway is that if you're making a TP adjustment for the intra-group sale uh, of a tangible good, then as an absolute minimum, you should be aware that you could be triggering a customs risk. Um, clear communication, like Tony said, and clear communication early on is key. Uh, because then the tax and customs teams can work jointly to consider the options and come up with a workable solution. Um, a final point is that um, it's never too late to seek advice. Um, for example, there are um, dispute resolution processes available, in both the customs and transfer pricing. Um, so your know, clear communication, uh, seek advice if you're unsure. Uh, you can't think of transfer pricing in isolation. It needs to, with tangible goods, it needs to work hand in hand with, that, with the customs implications. Um, so hopefully that's useful. We've still got uh, sort of five or 10 minutes for Q and A's and we've seen a couple coming in to the, uh, uh, to the box there. So let's see if we can uh, hopefully answer a few, a few of the questions and still, still time to, uh, put questions into the box at the end there. Um, the first question is on customs, Tony. So I wonder if you could uh, pick up this question. Where we received a question from the audience saying that um, Singapore doesn't have many items subject to import duty. Uh, so is it necessary to declare TP adjustments to the Singapore customs? Um, okay. Yes. Definitely. Um, the the point is not whether, in fact, there is there is duty uh, or not. The the point really is that it's a requirement because there is still GST uh, applicable to to um, imports, and so the value must still be um, declared. Um, it's, it's very important that you do that. Uh, customs in, in Singapore, while they're very transparent, I, I mean, if you think about it, um, the, the fact that the four items which are subject to duty or excise um, can be, those rates are fairly high. So the, the impact can quite be be quite significant uh, in terms of things like motor vehicle, alcohol, tobacco and cigarettes. But just from a pure GST perspective, yes, definitely you must declare uh, the um, adjustments. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, the second question coming in here, I can probably pick up most of this. Um, 
So someone asking, um, if we are importing commodities using the cut method, would you expect the price to be acceptable from both a TP and a customs perspective? Um, so there's a few a few variables here, but on you know, if you're importing commodities, so oil, gas, minerals, using the cut method, so that's effectively using the market price of the particular grade of commodity. Um, from a TP perspective, yeah, I mean that that is normally an acceptable, almost always an acceptable method because there's normally a clear market price for for most commodities. Um, so assuming that you know, they're, they're entrepreneurial buyers and sellers, and that is a that is a method we see, you see used a lot. So subject to, to um, a few variables, we typically expect that to be accepted. And then I think from from the customs side, um, you know, we, we said earlier on that the transaction TV transactional value, um, you know, where there's a clear a clear market price for the product, uh, that is that is typically the, the preferred method, or not just typically is the preferred method. From the customs side, so I'd say yeah, you know, when you're dealing with commodities, uh, with a, with an entrepreneurial buyer and seller of, of a physical commodity, obviously, um, you know, typically the the TP and the customs would be aligned using the cut method and the transactional value method. Um, but there's a there's a bit more details where we can uh, revert with more detail on that question. Um, Tony, there's another customs one here, which I can I can ask you to comment on. Uh, question is, do you have any advice or comments on what a company should be doing to possibly minimise disruptions at time of reporting adjustments to customs? Right. Yeah, that's um, a good question too. Um, I think one of you know besides what we've we've um, spoken about. Uh, in terms of internal communications uh, and, and documenting things. Um, now, some of the customs authorities do have processes whereby if you know, for instance, you have a, uh, a, a contract, if that contract has a, um, a review clause in it for your, for your value of your goods or your price of your goods, um, which means you you know at the time of import that your your price could likely change. Then you should uh, communicate with customs as well um, and seek their assistance in um, telling them that there is a review clause. Uh, you're not sure when in that period that. Uh, review would take place or if it will take place but you say okay I expect it within the next 12 months um, <clears throat> so what that means is that it puts your declaration you know, essentially you cleared your goods but the value is still not finalized um, you will be required to finalize it at the end of that 12 month period uh, by telling them whether, in fact, it has changed or has not changed, that will then finalise it. Uh, and there are other mechanisms that Customs has that you could use as well. So if if there is, if it's a related party transaction, if your history has been where you have had uh, regular adjustments, then you should reserve that right to uh, make those adjustments at some later stage. Uh, with customs, um, what that does is uh, it can, and I, and I can't say that it will always will, but it, it can uh, help you to minimise any penalties or to not get imposed with penalties should you may have to make that adjustment at a later date. Yeah? Thank you. Yeah, well, that's useful. And um... We've got time for one last question. We're coming up to the hour. Um, someone asking, can uh, around APAs, advanced pricing agreements in the transfer pricing world, uh, will a tax authority provide a joint APA and valuation ruling? I mean, I can give a brief comment to that. that, that I've not seen joint rulings with, with APAs and custom valuations. I think it's, for most countries, all countries, it's a separate source of rules. So, 
I think strictly speaking, an authority couldn't provide a formal joint ruling. Although you know, we, we've worked, APAs are becoming more popular, I'd say, and we've worked on a number recently. And I, I say, what, if you've got an APA, uh, it's probably persuasive and it's a, it's a good starting point for uh, customs valuation ruling. Some of the information will be the same. Um, but you know, often the two parts of the tax authority aren't closely enough connected to to provide a formal uh, joint ruling, albeit yeah. uh, that would be persuasive. So, Tony, have you got any comments on that one? Yeah, um, I, um, I, I mean, the closest I've seen to anything like that is really with Korean customs, but it's that's not a joint one. That's where Korean customs have um, given a value. They, they give provide a valuation ruling, um, which can be based on a transfer price um, or you utilizing a, a TP and TP study and documentation. Um, they would be probably the closest, I think, at this stage. But I've not seen anything that's been a joint um, effort yet. Um, now that might change um, because a, a number of revenue authorities are starting to merge. Um, but it, even like the UK, uh, they're merged, but a lot of their rulings are still separate too. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that may be a little way off yet. Okay, one to look for, look out for in the future. Um, so yeah, that brings us. We're now a minute or so over, so that brings us to the end of the webcast. Um, as you can see there, you can click to download CPE certificates if you need that. Um, but, um, thank you for your time today. Thank you for a lot of good questions there. We're going to get back to you on email because we haven't answered them all uh, with regard to time. But thank you very much for joining and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.